sex hormones. Um, you wouldn't believe it, but this is probably the fifth time I've recorded this, so uh, I think I'm getting better and better, and um, the program's getting <clears throat> it's, uh, frustrating me. Anyway, let's talk about sex hormones and which ones affect guys and girls, how they can manifest in the body. That means, you know, what things will you notice in people, what people will tell you, what words you need to be listening for that goes, mm, okay, maybe there's a sex hormone problem going on here. Um, I'll try and explain why some people can get too much of a hormone and why that happens. Um, some testing and just some little tips that you might be able to help people with. So there's quite a few different sex hormones that we produce and interesting, the whole reason we make sex hormones is so we can procreate, i.e. reproduce and um, from a biological perspective keep our um, line of heritage going. Um, <clears throat> with guys, they go through what's called puberty, um, where their sex hormones kick in around about the age of 14, 15, and they get a massive surge of testosterone. And testosterone is that hormone that enables them to be able to fertilize babies. Um, it's also responsible for all their sexual, or their sec what we call the secondary sexual characteristics. So they shoot up in height. Um, testosterone makes their muscle mass develop, their voice develop, so it becomes quite deep. Um, their testes drop, um, their penis elongate. And it also psychologically gets them into a different headspace as well. So you'll notice with guys or pre-puberty, they're kind of, I don't know, they're still mummy's boys. Aren't they? Well, all men are always mummy's boys. Um, no, they're, they're kind of, um, they're not as out to survive, whereas once testosterone kicks in, though, they get it. They're, they're like, no, I'm a man. Watch out. I'm a man. So testosterone alters their way of thinking in it. Um, in many countries, cultures, tribal civilizations, there's a lot of rites of passage but from going from being a boy into manhood, and uh, they make them not only, you know, once they recognize that things are changing, you know, a bit of facial hair or bit of chest hair, next thing they're, they're being thrown off a cliff face and they've got to show that they can survive in the bush or whatever else it is. Women, we get um, a massive surge in oestrogen and progesterone through the start of puberty. So that's when we go from being girls to women. And that varies around the world what time that'll kick in. Uh, in Australia, it's currently between the ages of 11 and 13, but that's, that's an average some girls will have periods when they're at 9 or 10, and that's fine. Others will have it when they're 15, 16, and that's probably a bit late, to be honest, um, but also fine. Um, most cultures in the world, tribal countries, India, Thailand, those sorts of places will have, um, will, the girls will experience puberty when they're 9 or 10, or even earlier, 8 or 9. Hence, they can become mothers quite early. And by the time they're 12, they might have a, a baby, one baby, and be pregnant with their next. Um, that's just the way we're designed. I don't think we need to read into it. It's We can't change it. It's just biologically how they're designed to be. So the big thing that kicks in for girls is oestrogen. And oestrogen can be spelt both ways, and they're both correct. You can spell it with an O or an E. Um, it, oestrogen wants us to fall pregnant every month. It's quite remarkable for women that our body... This doesn't conspire, but it's designed to try and fall pregnant every single month, hence the cycle. So oestrogen will get our whole reproductive body ready for that pregnancy. So it um, can make our boobies a little bit engorged. It will get the uterus ready. It will, even during sex after we ovulate, will try and scoop up the sperm. So our um, physical anatomy will change as well. Um, we during that time of ovulation, which is when the eggs hatched, um, the vaginal vault becomes quite slippery and slimy, which is how you can tell whether you've ovulated. And the whole idea there is to um, for it to suck or pull the sperm up into the uterus where it can meet the egg higher up. Uh, estrogen, it's it, as I said, it kicks in around puberty, so you'll find that little girls will suddenly become women. The breasts will develop, the hips will widen. They'll end up with pubic hair, armpit hair, unfortunately hair anywhere. Um, it strengthens our bones and it does play a role with blood pressure control and heart health and also the bone health. So it is implicated later in life when it drops off with osteoporosis and um, heart disease. But importantly, it kickstarts our cycle. So it, along with a couple of other hormones, dictate that we have a monthly cycle where the body wants to fall pregnant. 
progesterone similar for girls um, and these are the female ones I'll talk about guys as we go so at various points you might want to stop and pause and take some notes so I haven't got slides for everything that I'll discuss um, progesterone beautiful hormone it's so lovely it's calming it makes us shine it gives us good sex drive it stabilizes our endometrial lining the importance of that is <coughs> excuse me girls who have issues trying to conceive i.e. trying to fall pregnant or holding it so girls that have multiple miscarriages often in fact I'd say invariably have low progesterone so progesterone helps those things but in its primary role is um, in the body it just makes that endometrial lining nice and firm and stable it also makes the egg nice and stable um, and it helps with our sex drive incredibly it goes up quite a lot when women are pregnant and you'll notice towards the end of a, um, a pregnancy which is called the last trimester the last third women have this amazing shine or glean or glow aura about them and that's progesterone it goes up um, massively towards the end of pregnancy testosterone now in women and I haven't got an equivalent side slide for guys so I'll talk about them in a second testosterone in women we do produce it it's an androgen so male-ish type of hormone the way it responds but I, I've put it here under sex hormones but if you've heard me talk before and you'll hear it when I talk in the adrenal fatigue one um, testosterone I believe is better addressed as a stress hormone in women and that's because it does respond to stress it responds to us being busy it responds to us um, being competitive athlete male roles and um, goes up in those scenarios so whilst it is medically classified as a sex hormone I find in helping people uh, mitigate it or balance it it's better considering it as a stress hormone and um, what it does for us is it gives us good energy levels it can help us with our sex drive and our mojo and it helps us to um, develop muscle mass follicle stimulating hormone so just if we look at the follicle which means egg so when we're born as ladies inside the ovaries which is actually when our parents when our mums are made at that point she will have our genetic makeup for our ovaries so grandma's pregnancy is quite important on our genetic makeup um, but we're born with a finite number of eggs so as soon as we're conceived when our mum's you know ova or egg met our father's sperm our eggs were at that point determined for the rest of our life and they just lie there waiting to be told by follicle stimulating hormone that your gigs up off you go now's your day so they just lie there in the ovary and we've only got a set amount and um, follicle stimulating hormone comes down from the pituitary gland to an ovary and says okay get one of those little eggs that you've got hiding away in there and get it to come to down onto the table and let's bake it up um, which is where luteinizing hormone kicks in <coughs> excuse me it stimulates that follicle or that egg to develop and grow now I didn't do the boy hormones as sexy as the girl ones but um, the primary hormone or primary hormone that guys drive upon is called testosterone and in guys it's a it's a critical hormone it's um it really depicts the way they feel and think um, so it makes them quite manly it makes them very decisive they don't have self-doubt they're designed not necessarily to be the nurturers but to be the providers so they um, you know they go and do their gig that they're not as in touch with their emotions as women um, and that's because biologically testosterone is high and it's more about a providing outcome based hormone it's a survival hormone in um, it kicks in as I said during puberty it's responsible for all the second sexual characteristics you'll find in boys so they get oily skin um, they can get acne but if they get dirt behind the follicle um, they'll get extra facial growth um, body growth pubic hair growth their penis will enlarge testes will drop um, muscles will develop long bones will grow and voice will deepen so they're, they're all the symptoms of high testosterone um, it defines who a man is it's very important they produce progesterone um, we don't know as much about progesterone in guys because it's really shadowed by testosterone oh, sorry yeah progesterone sits in the shadow of testosterone um, but estrogen guys make and interesting estrogen is the hormone that I find is often out of balance in Australian guys um, you won't find it out of balance in tribal places where they're still running around with a spear in their hand 
hunting and gathering, their testosterone levels are quite good. Um, but in countries where guys are waking up, having a latte, going into work, sitting in an office, um, not seeing any sun, not really hunting per se, um, they, they their estrogen's going up. Um, it's not just because they've lost those manly activities, it's also a combination of other things such as herbicides and pesticides which lead to estrogen going up in their body and they're called exogenous sources which I'll talk about shortly. <coughs> Excuse me, so where are sex hormones made? Well, sex hormones are made in a, a range of what are called glands and glands are their body parts, they're, they're the same as organs, if you like, but they're called a gland. That's because they produce hormones. Um, and these are some of the main ones. So the pituitary gland sits behind your eyes, probably about two centimetres in between both eyes, behind the bridge of your nose. And it's about the size of the thumbnail. And the pituitary gland is called the master gland. And truly, when you look at what it does in the body, it, it, it's truly remarkable that... Um, it has a role to play in your thyroid, it has a role to play with sex hormones, it has a role to play with prolactin, oxytocin, relaxin, um, plays a role with antidiuretic hormone. It, it governs a whole stack of things in the body, which is why it's called the master gland. Uh, but it plays a big role with your sex hormones. The adrenal glands, once again, they're probably a little bit bigger than your thumb nail. They're probably the size of an almond. And they sit just above your kidneys, and you've got two of them. One pituitary gland, and they've got pituitary glands, there's one pituitary gland, um, but you've got two adrenal glands, and they sit above your kidneys, and they do so much as well. They produce all your stress hormones, some sugar hormones, some blood pressure ones, um, testosterone, cortisol, which are for inflammation, testosterone's for survival. Um, they produce a stack of hormones, so adrenal glands are, are very, very important. In girls, we've got ovaries. Guys don't have ovaries. Only women have ovaries. And there's two of them. And um, in most people, some people only have one or some have three, but majority of us have two. So if you roll your finger in from your hip tissue, I'm sorry, from your hip margin, so the top of your hip, and just roll it inwards, you'll discover an ovary and you've got one on each side. So when you have a ovulation pain, sometimes you can feel a little bit of pain in that area and that's coming from your ovaries. Fat tissue um, is actually will act like an organ or a gland and or adipose will and it makes lots and lots of estrogen. So that can be a problem for people who are overweight and um, in helping them lose weight, this is an interesting phenomenon, it's a real catch-22. Even though they've got high fat tissue or adipose tissue, you need to get that down, but invariably they'll have high estrogen, and until we get the estrogen down, they won't be able to lose the fat. But the fat makes estrogen. So you've got to have other tools rather than just exercise and nutrition to help them get rid of that adipose in the first place. I should have put in here, this This was obviously good for chicks, but um, I should have put in here testes, because they're a gland in men who help um, produce the... the testosterone which helps fertilize the sperm so that's quite important as well <clears throat> excuse me Got a little tickle of course sixth time I've recorded and I've developed a tickle what a surprise <laughs> so why do our hormones change well there's lots of reasons why um, nutritional status is huge so as a good example here is in men they might be making lots of testosterone which is fabulous but if they're low on zinc, then a lot of that will aromatize into what's called estrogen. Now, if that's happening, they'll end up with these high estrogen states. Might be okay with testosterone production, but estrogen will confuse everything. And the real cause of it is because they're low on zinc. There's lots of other macro and micronutrients, selenium, um, omega-3s, uh, B12, CoQ10, iron, will all impact on hormone production. So often, you know, short-changing these called the ASD, the American Standard Diet, or just a really quick diet, does not provide your body with enough nutritional value. So you can see hormone changes just because of that one thing. Uh, if the glands are overworking, so if they're being preoccupied with stress, then they'll, I, I believe that they won't make necessary hormones in other areas, and that's a common phenomenon. Um, <clears throat> this is really interesting. The viral or bacterial attacks on the gland, it's not something you read about it's not something you hear 
immunologists talking about because they're the doctors who specialise in this area. It's not really an area you hear naturopaths talking about. But I do believe that, um, and I've seen, I guess it's probably more observational, I've seen a lot of people who've had glandular fever in their youth or Epstein-Barr virus or they might have had cytomegalia virus or Ross River virus. And I'm sure those viruses attack either the, the glands, whether it's the adrenal glands or the thyroid, and we see years down the track a problem with the gland or the hormone production. When you take a, a really good history, they'll, people will tell you, oh, yeah, I spent two months flat in bed because I had glandular fever, or I took six months off school because I had glandular fever. So sometimes I think the um, backlash of viruses and how they attack the glands is not really widely understood nor appreciated. Um, surgical or mechanical damage will definitely affect our hormones and I put, should put in there radiation as well because lots of people are getting chemotherapy, um, radiotherapy, I should put in there chemotherapy, um, which is pharmacological damage, which is probably more the medication one down below, but surgical is when you know someone has um, a hysterectomy where they take the uterus out and sometimes they take the ovaries, suddenly we've got a hormone change. Or mechanical damage might be like Lance Armstrong cycling on a bike. Um, where the testes are squashed and compressed for hours, days on end, and that will create changes as well with testosterone production. So there's quite a few um, surgical and mechanical issues that will impact on hormone production. Increased demand. So when we're under stress, we ask the body to produce stacks more hormones than it does when it's at balance or relaxed. Same during pregnancy. There's multiple states where our body has to change the hormones that it's producing and if we don't switch that process off, it'll stay in overdrive. And that's, I guess, what I see a lot with stress is we might activate our stress response and we forget every day even, let alone, you know, chunks of weeks and time to switch off our stress. We just let it go unchecked. This last one's very interesting. So more and more <clears throat> women are turning to IVF, couples are turning to IVF. Um, more and more taking the pill just so they can study and get through and more and more taking, well I shouldn't say more and more with HRT, that's dramatically dropped off since 2002 since the Women's Health Initiative came out showing that HRT categorically causes breast cancer and ovarian cancer. However, IVF, the pill for women, um, confuses the body remarkably because it says, hey, you've suddenly got high levels of something, you didn't make it yourself, but the body doesn't know that. It just sees it in circulation through biofeedback. So it doesn't make it anymore. It'll just switch that system off or it won't be able to metabolize it and that'll give people a hormone imbalance. Let's put in here, even though it's not medication necessarily, anabolic steroids for guys. So um, steroid use, um, DEX or TEST, will confuse the body remarkably because suddenly you're giving the body lots of testosterone which confuses the body because it feeds back to the body that it's making it, even though it's not, it's an external source. Therefore, the body stops making testosterone. And a big problem for guys who take uh, anabolic steroids is they'll stop it and their body's natural levels won't kick in because it's not needed. it hasn't been needed to for so long. So it thinks it's doing its job. It stop the external source or the exogenous source and it's forgotten how to make it and there'll be an, often a big delay f um, time there. <clears throat> How do we know that hormone changes are occurring? Well, just ask people and start talking about it. You'll be surprised. Well, maybe you won't be surprised, but just in talking about hormones, people go, oh, that's me. Wow. Now I've got an answer. Hormone things that happen to us psychologically, socially, physically, rarely are put in terms of hormones. So it's not that people are, under, well, they're undereducated, so they're a little bit ignorant, but so are we. We as the um, health providers, I think, underestimate the role that hormones play, which is why I find them quite sexy and quite riveting and um, offer solutions for people. They, they really give you great insight. You know, why are we making too much? Why, why is this happening? These are why the symptoms are happening. Let's backtrack and work it all out. I, I do find that um, it offers a lot more understanding, a lot more relief for people. So I did a study in 2010 online for women and 84% of them felt that their hormones were out of balance. And I do think that that figure is fairly accurate and indicative of what's going on. It's a huge number. So if you can't shift weight, feel a little bit moody at times, suffer with any premenstrual stuff, feel not quite right, I believe that it's a hormone imbalance until proven otherwise. 
So how can we control our levels? Well, the biofeedback in the body is quite remarkable. So bio just means body feedback. And a part of your body called a gland will, like say, say the pituitary gland, will set down a certain amount of hormone to another body part. It waits for a reciprocal hormone to come back up to its original spot and say, yep, got the message, thank you. Now, if that's not happening because the reciprocal body part is sleepy or dormant, then it sends more of the hormone down until it gets that feedback hormone saying, yep, got the message. So hormones can change quite a lot during that time. Um, and which is why, you know, I was saying before about HRT or the pill, what you're doing there or even steroids, you're saying, no, I've got all that. So the body goes, okay, well, I've got the message back saying everything's A-OK down, down at the reciprocal organ. I'll just switch off and go in snooze mode. Then we stop it and then nothing kicks back in. So biofeedback is really important um, and that's how the body naturally can monitor whether the message is getting to where it needs to go. <coughs> now, let's go through a couple of the hormones and what you'll typically notice or see or feel um, if they're out of balance. And bear in mind, and I'll talk about this soon, but blood testing is not really the best way to determine sex hormone changes. So if people are making too much, or girls are making too much estrogen, I'll talk about guys in a minute. Um, if guys, girls are making too much estrogen, remember estrogen is responsible for all our reproductive tissue to grow and get us pregnant. So all the reproductive tissue will kick into overdrive and re uh, uh, grow at a quicker rate. So breast tissue, ovarian tissue, um, endometrial tissue, cervical tissue will increase in production. Now, if we're low on vitamin D as well, that which is the cancer surveillance vitamin of the body, if we're low on that and things start to mutate, disaster. You'll end up with cancers in those areas. And I'm not too sure statistically, but I do know that every single person I've treated with a reproductive cancer, women, male, will have, um, depending on the type in male, but particularly in women, those ones I've just outlined, will invariably have high estrogen. It also um, is like taking the pill, having too much estrogen on board. So our periods stop, so we can become infertile or not have periods. Um, we fail to conceive. We get low sex drive because, remember, progesterone is the thing that's responsible for our sex drive, and the gap between progesterone and estrogen is critical. So if we're making too much estrogen, not enough progesterone, off goes our sex drive, totally. Endometriosis is the phenomena where um, parts of or cells, endometrial cells, will dispatch up through the fallopian tubes and scatter around our pelvic cavity. Now, they um, will respond like a normal week or monthly cycle, and so they grow and get plump, and then they shed and bleed. Now, if you've got cells that are doing that, but they're stuck on the back of the gut wall, not inside the endometrial cavity, that creates enormous pain. So um, painful, heavy periods often are due to endometriosis, in fact, statistically, but who would know this, it's probably a lot higher, we know statistically that it affects at least 10% of the world's population. If we isolate it to certain groups, so, you know, tribal girls don't really have this issue, it's really a Western phenomena, it's probably a lot higher. Fibroids are um, when cells start to grow dysplastically, so they don't make beautiful new cells, they make these tough, tenacious cells, um, and it's almost like scar tissue. So fibroids can develop anywhere, but most, you know, in this scenario, let's talk about them on the uterus. Um, and they can be small from a centimetre through to huge, like five centimetres. And you can end up with multiple fibroids. You can end up with them in your breast, and they create these lumps. Um, if they're on your uterus, and they can create very painful periods, or they can stop you impregnating and falling pregnant. Um, premenstrual syndrome, PMS, and that's the pre, meaning before, menstrual, before your period. Um, symptoms or syndrome, when the estrogen will be at its highest, you'll know about it if you've got too much estrogen and not clearing it out. So typical symptoms will be mood changes, you know, get upset really quickly, get angry really quickly, retain fluid, um, get irritable bowel, get bloating, constipated, um, just don't feel right. <clears throat> so that's PMS. Might get acne or migraines as well. Um, any time of the month, any mood changes I'll often find depression, anxiety, obsessive compulsiveness stuff, um, Bridget Jones, you know, on and off the scales, crying, woe woe me stuff, often women will have a high estrogen. 
fluid retention and weight gain. So the chicks of us, the girls of us who can gain these three kilos just before our period, definitely due to high estrogen. And weight gain often is due to high estrogen as well. And the inability to lose weight will often be because testo um, estrogen or testosterone is stopping us from doing it. Cellulite, so um, cellulite is a combination of high estrogen and toxins and headaches, migraines can also be caused by too much estrogen. Haven't got skin changes there, but definitely acne and pimples will come on with too much estrogen as well. And in menopause, flushes. So typically through menopause, we think of flushes being due to low estrogen, but often high estrogen will cause it too. So I might just cover this here for guys. Um, and you might want to take notes on this because they don't have these things, but too much estrogen in men will create prostate changes. So prostate cancer is definitely a high estrogen cancer. It will make them quite depressed. Oh, I shouldn't say quite depressed. It can make them a little bit depressed or anxious or self-doubting. It will give them what happens to us during puberty, essentially, breast development, widening of the hips so they get love handles and they can get tummy fat. And in men, that's due to high estrogen. Steroids will do it. Um, high estrogen will do it. Not good. <coughs> Excuse me, low estrogen. It's really not as common um, as high estrogen. The times I do see low estrogen will be through menopause, and it's not with every woman. In fact, a lot of menopausal women do the opposite and still have high estrogen. So low estrogen um, dries things up. So they end up with dry vagina. Um, they don't feel like sex. They can end up with dry eye syndrome. They can end up with um, dry mouth. Now be due to low estrogen. Sometimes, sometimes it's actually due to low progesterone as well. But typically when they've got low estrogen, they don't feel like sex because it is painful. They haven't got sex drive anyway. Often with low estrogen, you'll find they've got low testosterone. So sex is one of those things that goes out the door, unfortunately. Um, and later in life, it can lead to osteoporosis and heart disease. Um, progesterone also plays a role, though, with those two states as well. Guys, low estrogen really doesn't matter as much. It's more the high estrogen men that's the problem. Testosterone. <clears throat> Excuse me. Testosterone, my um, book, The Beauty and the Beast Within, is all about this. So women in modern society seem to be producing above and beyond what they need on the testosterone front. And that's why, look, I've mentioned it here on the sex hormones, but really I find if you can consider it more to be a stress hormone, it gives you a lot greater understanding about why it's been elevated in the person and therefore how you can help her manage it and mitigate it. I'll just cover guys before I go into the girl stuff. So guys with high testosterone, yeah, it occurs. Um, it uh, um, can be caused by multiple things, but steroids will do it for starters. So if they're taking external sources of steroids, that'll push their testosterone up, and which is why they take it. Um, but so will competitive stuff. So people who are you know, firemen or... Um, people, are w guys watching sport or guys under st in stressful situations can push their testosterone up. So that can make them have some of these symptoms. So they can get quite aggressive. They can get pimples. Um, they can have this um, insatiable sexual appetite. So they just want sex all the time. They can get baldness. They can get a lot of facial hair. If they're low on zinc, they will convert it to estrogen and they'll suffer those symptoms I was talking about before with high estrogen. Um, now let's go back to ladies with too much testosterone. They um, adapt those second sexual characteristics that young guys experience through puberty. So they get oily skin, so they can get pimples. Um, they get hair growing, so they can get a little moustache, or they get whiskers on their chin, or they get hairy forearms, or they can get a snail trail. Um, they can have a receding hairline like a widow's peak. They often will have nice muscle definition. <coughs> Excuse me, they get a deep voice. Uh, a lot of them... And I don't know if this is because they're morphing into a man, but they, they will stop their periods so they can become infertile. Um, or they can develop cysts on their ovaries, which are called uh, classified as polycystic ovary syndrome or PCO. Um, and they do tend to be a little less compassionate. So estrogen is our nurturing and mothering hormone. Testosterone is more the fight, survival uh, 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 hormone. Where's the outcome? So there's a lot less compassion in women who have high testosterone. Once again, that's observational. Low testosterone for guys, really, I see it a lot. Um, so if we just cover guys, um, low testosterone in men makes them self-doubt and they won't put on muscle. They just become that doughy couch potato um, and they lose their, yeah, they just lose their mojo and their purpose. 
Um, women who drop testosterone, and I do see it relatively commonly through menopause, it's almost like they just get to this age and just go, fiff, burn out. So adrenal glands make testosterone, as do muscles and other components. But low testosterone, um, I find, is either menopausal or burnout in women. And, you know, the burnout, as I said, might be stress or it might be a virus. Um, it'll lead to low sex drive in both sexes. So they're just, you know, if a guy tells me he's got no sex drive straight away, I'm like, right, you've got low testosterone. If a girl tells me she's got low sex drive, I think low testosterone or high estrogen or low progesterone. Guys, though, it's straight away low testosterone. Um, low energy levels because it is a feel-good, invincible hormone. And it, if you're low on testosterone, you won't make muscle despite how much training you do. So just to recap on those two hormones in both sexes. So in men, high estrogen will cause doughy thinking, uh, moves, love handles, maybe depression, some anxiety, um, and it can lead to prostate cancer. Um, low estrogen in guys, not a problem. High testosterone in guys, you will see it, particularly if they're taking external sources and taking um, anabolic steroids. It'll make them aggressive. Um, it can make them bald. It, uh, steroids will shrink the penis and shrink the balls, uh, excuse me, their scrotum and their testes. Um, but it can, um, low testosterone um, in guys is more of a issue when it's naturally occurring and they um, become yeah, you know, the, the imbalance between the high estrogen and low testosterone is very important. So once again, they can suffer with a, a bit of anxiety, um, not feeling like a man, losing their um, mojo, losing their sex drive. Now in women, slightly different, but high estrogen will create PMS, headaches, migraines, skin problems, weight gain, fluid retention, um, period problems, all those cells will grow, so breast cancers, ovarian cancer, endometrial stuff. Um, low estrogen, things dry up. And I just want to finish on the sex hormones with progesterone. Progesterone is beautiful. It's, um, it's a really calming hormone. Um, guys produce it, but let's just talk about specifically here with women because testosterone in men is their real driving hormone, whereas women, the balance of progesterone to estrogen is really important. And I've got there, it's almost a waste of a slide putting up high progesterone because I just don't see it unless the person is being given a cream or taking wild jam or... Um, some external source, the body seems to balance it quite nicely and natural like, too much production just doesn't seem to happen. Low progesterone though is really common. Um, I see it, I don't know, it, all the time. Um, it, 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 as I said before, it, it kicks in through pregnancy so women get this shine in their skin and their hair and they've got this bubble and sparkle in their eye and that's progesterone. So when they're low on progesterone, they don't have it. They look quite, you know, just like they're going through the motions. They look a bit dull and lacklustre. Um, it will dry the skin up. And it's a really critical hormone when you talk about sex drive. So women with low progest um, sex drive will often have low progesterone. Um, it also plays a huge role in our periods. So regular 28 to 32 day periods um, are dependent on good progesterone levels. Um, we don't want clots in our period. We don't want um, pain with our period. We don't want heavy periods, and often that will occur if we're low on progesterone. And a shorter cycle is often due to low progesterone and or high estrogen. They tend to go hand in hand, actually. Um, progesterone helps us fall pregnant, so it plays a role in making sure the egg's nice and robust, and it has a huge role to play in the implantation. So once the egg's been fertilised, it travels down into the uterus. We need high progesterone levels so it can embed inside the endometrial wall and hold. So if a girl tells you she's failing to fall pregnant or can't maintain a pregnancy, lots of miscarriages, you've got to start suspecting low progesterone. And as I said, it's so, so common. Um, I, I, yeah, it's something I see all the time and it will lead to PMS as well. So low progesterone is pretty tricky to treat. Um, I, I find that um, relaxation and getting women to... Um, I'll, I'll talk about that more actually, how to get it up because it's, it's tricky. But relaxation and reflection is critical just getting them to feel comfortable in the space of the now rather than racing forward all the time and let alone putting themselves on this little um, treadmill of life um, which depletes progesterone is really important. And I do use a couple of herbs which will also bring progesterone up in the short term if I need to. So can people get too much of a hormone? Sure can. Um, and that's 
not just because your body's responding to different stresses and different things, but because we're ingesting it or inhaling it. So they're called ex exogenous sources. Um, it's been proven pesticides, herbicides, weedicides, chemically, structurally look like estrogen. So we're getting bombarded with estrogens from our environment. Fuel, interestingly, um, and lead paints and different other paint constituents will act like estrogen inside the body. And in fact, Dr. John Lee, who's a specialist in thyroid management, says that sitting in a car for 10 hours a day, i.e. one hour to work, one hour back from work, is the equivalent of taking the oral contraceptive pill. That's how much xenoestrogen you're exposed to. Um, and it also explains to me this estrogen phenomena. Um, you know, we, we inhale it, we eat it in our foods. It explains to me why, you know, I live on the Gold Coast. If we jump on a plane and go to Vanuatu, which is two and a half hours away, there's no estrogen issues there. They live in huts. There's no paint. There's no carpet. There's no um, adulterated food. It's still organic. They don't have any breast cancer. They don't have any ovarian cancer. They have very happy women. And that's because their estrogen levels are all normal. So, yeah, the way we structure our lives and the foods we allow to come into our body are critical in keeping our hormones balanced. The other part to it is not being able to clear it and metabolize it. So metabolizing, let's just talk about estrogen again, um, it comes down to the role of the liver. Now, the liver was designed to cope with, you know, grabbing a few berries and eating a bit of an animal and just living in a cave. It can do that. That's, the liver can fulfill that gig. But if we expect it to detoxify lots of chemicals in our foods or lots of makeups that we feel we've got to put on our face or shampoos that we've got to use in our hair, um, all those sorts of things, it gets really um, overwhelmed with all of that. Then let's say we have a headache or a Panadol um, or alcohol thrown in there, which the liver also has to metabolize. And you can see before too long, it just can't keep up. So the fact that we're not metabolizing our hormones comes falls back on our liver. And our livers are really copying, uh, battering in um, modern living. Um, and then we've got to get rid of it every day. So we've got to actually excrete it with waste product, um, which is reliant on the bowel and the kidneys working well. Now, if you're not going to the loo, opening your bowels every day, estrogen will re be reabsorbed out of your bowel and um, you can end up with high estrogen just from that cause alone. Oversupply and stress is a huge one, nutrient deficiencies, etc. So, yeah, can we get too much of a hormone? Yes. Is it a good thing? No. We're designed to be hormonally balanced. How do we test our hormones? Well, there's a variety of ways. World Health Organization, WHO, advocates saliva testing being the best way to measure sex hormones. And that's just because of how they um, bind in our body and how they get carried around. In blood, it's a really inaccurate way because they get bound to a thing called serum hormone binding globulin. When they prepare the blood, they throw that part away with fat, and that's where the hormones live. So it just gives you a ballpark. Unless you're seeing a doctor who specializes in hormones day in, day out, blood testing for sex hormones can be an absolute waste of time. And you might be find you or your clients are told, oh, no, your hormones are fine, but in actual fact, they're not. Um, if you were to do a saliva test on that same patient, you'll get radically different results. Interesting, just mapping out people's symptoms will often give you a lot of information, unless it's guys. I mean, testosterone's not cyclical. It, it's, it's quite spontaneous. Um, but definitely with women, estrogen and progesterone, you'll find there'll be a monthly swing. Um, I, I've written this book, Beauty and the Beast Within. Um, people, your clients, or you can access it online. I've got all my books, so the Fertil Fit for Fertility, Menopause and Keeping Up, which is for men. And I'm putting one out soon on burnout, which is about adrenal fatigue and thyroid health. Um, all available online, and people can just download them, you know, as an ebook and read about the hormones and uh, get a greater appreciation, as well as find out good results. So, how can you help people with hormone imbalances? I think it's really important to have a practitioner who gets this, who understands what it's about. I don't think it's as simple as going to the health practitioner in a free health food shop and getting I'll go over to Shelf X and get that. They're missing the point. Hormones reflect what we're doing in our life. So it's almost a life coaching role that we play when we're going to help people with their hormones because, yeah, sure, we can give them false hormones or bioidentical hormones or we can even augment them with herbs. But until we help people balance their lives, we're always just chasing the hormone. But if we help the gland produce only what it needs to produce in a harmonious way, that's where the real joy for 
really comes from for these people. Um, so it's important to have a good practitioner or a good life coach, wellness coach. Um, some testing is always good just to validate how people are feeling. Um, as I said, you can refer them to buy an ebook. One of my ebooks will give them a fairly good understanding and you'll be able to help them with the rest of it. Um, and I've, I've made lots of YouTube clips over the years just explaining hormone imbalances. <clears throat> so this is life coaching. Identify, help the person identify what makes them happy. Now, this is a huge part of helping people with hormones. So many people are doing stuff that's out of line with their values that they begrudgingly do because they're just paying off a mortgage or they want their second kid to go through private school. And they're, they're really quite unhappy or resentful. So we've got to say, you know, what does your most perfect day look like? Now, I'm saying these things if, if, if it's really easy to do, but it's not. You have to sit down with a person and give them tools and equipment and help them understand that this is the real gig. And they have absolute direct control over what they're getting out of their body and life. And understanding what they want is a critical part to that. I've put together the um, eight-week body lifestyle program, and it's incredible for helping people with this. There's you know, 200 pages of different activities that help them understand what they want out of this life, what their purpose is, what their values are, and how to design a life around that. Because once they do that, their hormones will balance on their own. Um, and you know, working out what your self-brand is, what your legacy is, all those things, they're, they're really big things that we're not really encouraged to do really from the, the minute we leave school. We're just designed to focus on our careers and our kids and looking great you know, for everyone else. But um, the, the truism and the value in life is working out what you want to achieve, what is important to you in life and designing your world around it. So happy hormones will then come from knowing what you want and then you can make some little goals or mini steps towards that. Um, that's my little boy when he was about two and he does lots of travelling. Um, so once people, you've helped people establish what they do want and what they want to leave as a legacy, then we just kind of coach them from the side and just remind them from time to time, you know what, you told me that that wasn't important, you told me this was. Uh huh. So that's where real accountability comes in and we can really facilitate their happiness by knowing this information. One of the biggest faux pas I think we do in this busy life is that we don't stop and reflect enough. Now, if I say to people, go and, yoga, go and do yoga or meditate, a lot of people have resistance to that and they'll go, I can't do it, I don't need it, whatever. I go, okay, grab a glass of red wine at the end of the day, go and sit out the back of your yard or in your courtyard or your balcony or whatever it is, turn all the noise down and think about what you enjoyed over that last day. Now, if something really made you buzz and ticked all your buttons, you want to make sure you get some of that the next day and maybe double the dosing of it. So it's the only, the, the power of reflection allows us to do that. Um, you might find that, as I said, a lot of people go, oh, I don't want to meditate. If you frame it up a different way, oh, I'm quite happy to do that. And that's what we have to encourage people to do, to stop, reflect, and then emulate what they do like about their lives and let go of the other stuff. So here are some tips, and I haven't put here, but uh, I've touched on the low sex drive thing, and it is a thing I see a lot, and you will come across a lot in clients, and it, it, it's about connection and feeling good. So um, this is one big tip I get people to do with low sex drive, apart from balancing their hormones, and some people I've got to get them to factor 30 minutes three times a week into their schedule so they do get, you know, have time allocated for sex. Somehow they think it's going to budge over the washing or the children's cooking or something and it never does funnily enough so with sex um what i'll get couples to do is what's called a wish box and each couple's writes on a different piece of paper um they just need to do it once every now and then so guy blue piece of paper girls pink whatever doesn't matter um write down some wishes so the girl might want to have the rubbish put out have a feet massaged have taken on a picnic taken to the movies have a neck massaged toes tickled, whatever it might be. The guy might all come up with 26 things. It doesn't matter. It's quite irrelevant. So everyone gets to have their own little wish. They write down 20 different ones or 20 the same. doesn't matter. Tear them up, put them into an ice cream bucket. Now the other partner will pull out one of the partner's wishes. And they do that one wish per week at the beginning of the week. They don't announce what it is to the other person, but the game is to instigate it, just integrate it into the everyday life. So the guy at least that week will get one of his wishes 
and the girl will get one of her wishes. So everyone's happy. It's a great way to bring back a bit of spark, especially if sex drive is one of the issues which guys complain about regularly. She just doesn't feel like it or won't initiate it. And girls go, do I have to? At least with this game, she knows that the trade-off is she's going to get something she wants and everyone seems quite happy. Um, for other people, some other tips for hormone balancing. These are what I, I've got on this page here that I refer to as green light activities and I cover this a lot more in the adrenal fatigue uh, recording. Um, but green lights make us feel good. They take us towards our higher purpose. Um, we might put 60 minutes into it, but we get 90 minutes back out, so we get 60 minutes of good fun. But it also means we need less sleep or we think better with other activities. Facebooking can be good for certain people, sports, brilliant, dancing, yoga, weekends away, book clubs, art groups, TAFE, cooking classes, self-directed learning, all that sort of stuff are fabulous. Now, when you're getting people to do these things, just a really hot tip. I've noticed if I say to people, I want you to stress less, they look at me and go, okay, what does that mean? So what I've stopped, so I've stopped saying it because they don't get it. I don't get it either, if you, to be honest. But if I say to them, okay, I want you to have 30 minutes of fun a day, then they can go, okay, what's fun? And then we can brainstorm what fun is. So fun might be, you know, watching two dogs play or watching your kids laugh or watching a funny comedy on TV. So stressing less is very hard for people to do, but having more fun is possible. So... Get them to have more fun or get them to do something they love or something that gives them more energy. The other thing, you know, these things I've got listed here, which I call green lights, I've got there with the art groups. I'll say to people, you know, have you ever tried art? No. Well, let's try it. Now just look at you blankly and then go, okay, this is what I want you to do. So we have to be a little bit more instructional in the first instance. Okay, what I really want you to do is spend the next $100 that you make or have or go now and do it and put it on credit card. Go to the local shopping centre, go into an art shop, buy um, a huge big fat canvas, buy six tubes of paint and five brushes and have some fun on the canvas. And they look at you and I go, I give you permission to do it. They go, oh, okay, all right, off they go and they do it. And they have immense fun and it's worth, you know, 300 bucks, not $100. But we have to give them permission. Firstly, we have to give them the idea and the instruction. Um, and then we have to give them permission to do it, and then it becomes a little bit self-fulfilling. But initially, you'll get blank stares from people. So I have learned over the years that saying stress less means nothing, have more fun means something, or go and do this with these specific instructions, they can do. And um, that will help them balance the hormones quite a lot. So you do under need to understand that hormones are really impacting on all of us, and they're not going to go away because they're part of who humans are. But the more you can understand people through a sex hormone perspective, the more you can help them find that connection, sex drive, sex balance, fat loss, weight loss, um, psychological balance. Um, nutrition is critical, which is why I put together a whole other recording on that. Having strategies, so helping people with plan Bs. Look, th this stuff is really life coaching and life changing. Um, the as I said, the eight-week lifestyle transformation program covers a lot of this and you might be better off just referring them to that because this is a whole new area. But just so you understand that, yes, you can touch and tackle hormones front on or you can help people with their life and that's where the real balance and joy comes from. People need to have boundaries and um, you, the best thing you can do for people is give them hope. So balance, uh, this will probably be relevant for all of us, I suppose. For every up activity we do, exercise, RPM, budgeting, fanatical work, we need to balance it with a down activity. Reflection, let's not call it meditation, reflection. Um, this is where less is more. Um, people definitely need to have a good support crew around them. And I say to people, if you haven't got the best doctor around you, then sack them. Oh, they look at you blankly and go, no, you're, you're worthy of the best. Simple as that. Best personal trainer, the best doctor, the best nutritionist, best masseuse, the best body worker. Get the people around you in your life that are the best. People need to laugh more, love more, and read more. Anyway, I hope that's given you some ideas. Any questions, um, just pop them on the Facebook page, and I'll endeavor to answer them. Any feedback, I'd love to hear it, because um, even though I'm an expert in sex hormones, I'm learning every day about people and tricks of the trade. Thanks for that. Bye.